The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IONS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. There's a famous poem by a 19th century poet named Francis Thompson titled The Hound of Heaven, in which the author describes how God tracked him down like a dog chasing a rabbit. And here are four lines from that poem. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthian ways of my own mind and in the midst of tears. Our guest today, Nancy von Elfen, was hounded like that by God, it seems. And when she experienced a series of remarkable, spiritually transformative experiences that took her from agnostic to believer, um, and that's what she's here to talk to us about today. As a teen, she concluded God was unprovable, but then God decided to change her mind. Alone one night, Nancy watched a YouTube video of a young man named Ben Breedlove, given little time to live. In anger, Nancy raised her fists and railed about suffering to a God in whom she didn't really believe. To her amazement, God responded, and thus began a journey from doubt and uh, to belief as she struggled to understand messages she was given about suffering and reincarnation. In progressively profound experiences, her interactions with God, Jesus, and angels chipped away at her agnosticism until her doubts were removed. Nancy received a bachelor's degree in anthropology from Oberlin College and an associate's degree in journalism from Lorain County Community College. She's been a volunteer with IONS and has facilitated an IONS group in Philadelphia. She's been a longtime hospice volunteer and has been a big sister in the Big Brothers Big Sisters program. She tells about her revelations in her book, Caught Between Heaven and Earth, my profound encounters with God and the remarkable truth of our existence. Nancy, welcome to NDE Radio. Thank you so much, Lee. I really appreciate that. And I must say, I have not uh, heard the, that poem before, the lines from it. And uh, it's very apropos. <laughs> didn't, didn't you think so? I thought so. Uh, when, I, when I first heard your story, I said, God never pursues <laughs> the... <laughs> Uh, someone as as avidly as he has you. So, anyway, uh, that's Nancy, right. And it seems like the uh, author of the poem, uh, the, the the person in the poem, may have been pursued a lot longer than I was because uh, my experiences, and I call them my core experiences, because I realize um, that things had happened before this, and certainly things happened after. But uh, the, the real bulk of uh, the experiences happened in a relatively short period of time, about six months. Hmm. Well, you had been uh, you'd had a bit of a Catholic and Baptist combined background growing up. But basically, as I understand it, you were an agnostic when that one night you were watching the YouTube video of Ben Breedlove, uh, who, who was, I should tell the audience, a young man who suffered from HCM, hydrotrophic cardiopathy, cardiomyopathy. And um, I went and watched it after I talked to you. He tells his story in cards he holds up with the music from Mad World playing in the background, which is very moving music along with everything else. He tells about how one time when he nearly died, he saw that um, what I would call the light of God. And, uh, and you were understandably upset about his suffering so then tell us what happened after that. Well, uh, Ben actually made two videos and I had watched the first one. And after I watched it, uh, you know, I got up from the couch to get a drink of water. And at that point I was already, uh, you know, some tears were coming out and I felt this lump in my throat and I just had this overwhelming compassion for what this boy was going through and what his family must have been going through. And uh, somewhere on my way from the living room couch to the kitchen, I got angry 
so my sadness morphed into anger and I couldn't contain myself. I, I started yelling at a God, as you said, that I didn't really necessarily know was there or not because I was agnostic. Mm -hmm. So I started yelling at God about suffering. And I used that word suffering over and over again in this tirade at God. You know, why do people have to suffer? Why is this young boy, you know, why did he have to suffer like this? And his family is suffering and, uh, you know, suffering is such bullshit. I remember just being angry and, and really, uh, I know it sounds a little bit, uh, you know, um, silly, but I was raising my fists at God. I was mad. And uh, in the middle of all of that, there's a loud knock on my front door, which kind of startled me because it was, you know, it was nearing dusk and I, I never had that many visitors to our house. Uh, my daughter was out, my husband was traveling and really nobody ever came to the front door because we, our house was situated on a corner. But Nonetheless, I uh, sort of wiped the tears away that were still on my face and went to the front door. And uh, I don't know why I was nonchalant about opening it, but I did because normally I would be a little more careful. But for some reason, I just opened the door and there were two people standing there. <clears throat> there was a, a gentleman. They were both older people, robust. And the gentleman was standing next to the door, obviously the one who had knocked. Um, and two steps down where the stair walkway met the stairs was an older woman, also robust with a black shawl around her. I can still remember what they looked like. I opened the door and, uh, you know, it's like, yes. <laughs> and the gentleman looked at me. I, I looked right into his eyes as he talked to me, but he said the only thing that either of them would say to me. He said, we just came to tell you that suffering isn't going to last forever. Now, you can imagine, Lee, I was <laughs> pulled over because it felt like God had just responded to me. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I'm sure I looked stunned, <laughs> but I, I didn't know what else to say. I just <laughs> looked at them. And they said nothing else. They were shaking their heads with a smile on their faces. You know, I looked to the woman. She was confirming, shaking her head. Yes, you know. And there was an uncomfortable silence because, again, they said nothing else. And I was waiting for them to say something, you know, uh, invite me to their church or, you know, start to give me a, a lecture or whatever the case may be. But uh, they didn't say anything else. So I slowly shut the door. And as I shut it, I said, uh, assuming that they were from a church, I said, well, good luck with your mission. Hmm. And I walked what was about probably eight paces back to the couch, still stunned. Um, and I did one of those things where you barely sit down and you, you hop right back up. Mm -hmm. So I did that. I rushed over to the door opened it expecting just to see their backs with them having turned around because again, they were old. The, the man had a cane. So obviously he wasn't walking fast, but I opened the door and there was nobody there. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were just gone and it, it surprised me that they could be, you know, gone that quickly. So I tiptoed out. I, I, I looked around the corners of the house, down the walkway. There was absolutely nothing. Looked to the other houses. Uh, there were no cars going by. It was dusk, so I could still see. Um, they were absolutely gone, Lee. Mm. Now, that, for some people, would have been enough. <laughs> but, <Yeah. laughs> but not for you. So then, not too long after that, I, I take it, the hound pursued you in a lucid dream. Uh, so tell us about that. That's correct. Um, well, after this incident, uh, this first incident with the angels, uh, I, I sort of went back and forth with myself because it was probably the strangest thing that ever happened to me and was so 
unreal, you know, mm. that they could have just disappeared and that they seemed to answer, answer me. Um, so I have to say, I went in the, in the week that followed, I think it was about a week, uh, back and forth with myself saying, oh my God, what happened? Oh, come on, Nancy. They must've been outside hearing you or, uh, you know, you, you, you must have sat on the couch longer than you thought. So I did go back and forth with myself, but ultimately uh, my conclusion was that was just something really weird coincidence. And, you know, there had to be an, an explanation, a reasonable, logical explanation for it. And I let it go. Um, tried to get on with, you know, the normal everyday life, which I could very easily because Traditionally, I was very logically oriented and it was easy just to let it slip away. Mm. But one night uh, I was sleeping in bed. My husband was next to me and I was in a deep sleep. Lee. I wasn't dreaming. Um, but all of a sudden I felt and, and I'm sure your your listeners have had this experience. You're just laying down or you have your eyes closed and you feel someone in your space. You just know somebody is standing there. Yes. That is the sensation that I had and it woke me up. Now I cannot say that it, I opened my physical eyes, but my consciousness became fully awake at that moment, uh, knowing that somebody was standing there. And the moment my consciousness became aware um, I saw in the distance and I guess I'm, it must've been around, I don't know, maybe six feet, but it was a, it was smaller, like a, a smaller window, uh, which was odd because I had felt somebody standing right next to me. But again, my awareness, uh, opened my, I'm going to say spiritual eyes. And I saw someone in the distance, uh, in front of me and a little bit to the left. And the, the craziest thing is that I recognize immediately that it was Jesus. And I have to say that in my lifetime, I never gave much thought to Jesus. You know, I had some religious upbringing, but um, by the time I was eight years old, that was, that was finished. And uh, by the time I had become a teen, I thought, you know, Jesus is kind of cool. He said some cool things, but I don't really necessarily believe he is who he said he was. And um, there were a lot of uh, lots of other things that went into my agnostic thinking, but that's kind of what it was. And really, since the time I was very, very young, I, I, I never gave Jesus another thought. But here he was in the middle of my sleep in the middle of my bedroom, in the middle of my life. Mm. And I knew him. I knew that I knew him. And it was um, the way I describe it in my book is, is the best way that I can describe it. it was sort of like seeing an old friend in the grocery store that you didn't know was in town. And uh, you, you call out their name as I did. So as soon as I saw Jesus and I knew it was him, I, I said, telepathically because it wasn't speech oriented. I said, Jesus, what are you doing here? <laughs> hmm. And the moment that I had that thought tele telepathically, um, Jesus moved in without it being a, an active move. It was just all of a sudden his entire face took up my entire field of vision. So um, it went from, you know, snap from one scene to the next where he was close, so close that, you know, it was as if he was right in front of my face. But the interesting thing was that I could not see his face. Mm. So I was able to see the hair um, and it's very much like I saw it in some very traditional paintings, you know brown, wavy, shoulder length, parted in the middle. Um, but the face was blurred out with these cloudy striations, horizontal striations. And I have to laugh a little bit, Lee, because um, especially at the time uh, when the, this vision had ended and I realized uh, 
I asked a question at that point and I sort of beat myself up because I asked what I thought at the time was the most superficial question a person could ask when Jesus would appear to you. So when he appeared close up, I said, what do you look like? Mm. Uh, You know, I could have asked anything, but in retrospect, and it didn't take me that long to figure this out in retrospect, that was the question that uh, Jesus wanted me to ask. I'm Mm. positive because the answer was profound So it was a three-part answer. And as soon as I asked that question, what do you look like? My awareness, my vision, if you will, my spiritual vision was snapped to the right as if, you know, you would turn your head to the right very fast, but it was my consciousness. So it was snapped to the right and I saw all of these pictures being rifled through as if there was were an invisible thumb on a deck of cards and the cards would be falling from the corners, but they were pictures and they were pictures of every type of person you could imagine, every race, um, color, creed. I could even tell some were rich, some were poor. And the, it came so quickly and I absorbed the answer very quickly So when these pictures stopped, um, one one picture, and and these pictures, I I have to say too, as they were, you know, falling onto the stack, um, I could see the top picture. So the last one that fell was a picture of a father and a son. And that picture rose off the deck of pictures slowly at this point, it slowly rose up and a little bit further to the right as I followed it. And I stared at it and it was clearly a picture of a father and a son. And that is the message that I got. I look like everyone and I am the father and the son. So the message was very clear to me. Now, the third part of this answer is much more personal. And I'm still, to this day, not 100% sure what it means. I think I know what, it, what this last part of the answer meant, meant, although it has yet to happen. But when I received that last answer, I, I am also the father and the son, I expected maybe the picture to go away but it still hung there. It just hung there as if I was supposed to notice something else about it. So I stared at it and I remember thinking, well, this is a picture that could be on someone's mantle. You know, it's a a father with his arm around his um, son's shoulder. The son looked about 13 years old and the son had his arm around his dad's waist. And, uh, they had a very distinctive look. So they were both a little bit heavier. And I don't want to say very heavy, but a little bit heavy on the portly side. Um, dressed quite plain. And as I was thinking these things through, something hit me about them. And I thought, they look Mexican. They had very dark hair, a little bit darker skin. And I thought they look Mexican. And as that thought occurred to me, the picture vanished and the vision ended. Wow. So what I think that third part is about, um, very interestingly, where I lived in Ohio at the time, there was not really a Mexican population to speak of. You know, there was a Mexican restaurant in town and the the family was actually, they were my clients um, because I used to do marketing, uh, had my own little side thing doing marketing and I would, you know, take care of their website and so forth for them. And this father and son was not anyone from that family. So I thought at the time, where am I ever going to meet Mexican people, you know? Mm -hmm. But uh, fast forward two years later, and my husband had to be relocated to South Jersey for his job, where there is a very large Mexican population. 
And I very often run into Mexican people here and deal with Mexican people, though I, I cannot say that I have run into those two people, that father and that son at this point. But my gut feeling is that somehow, some way, I will cross paths with them. Mm-hmm. And uh, over and the you'll, years... And you'll have to say, you remind me of God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As everyone does these days, and since my experiences, because the um, I think one of the the biggest messages that I was given, you know, in, in Jesus telling that uh, telling me that he looks like everyone because he is everyone, and he's also the Father and the Son. Well, that makes us all one, because if Jesus is us and he's also the Father and the Son. That means we are all one. Exactly. And, and uh, you know, I showed that at some point at an IONS conference in a very rudimentary Venn diagram with God, Jesus, and humanity overlapping and then in the middle. Mm. So we're all separate but one. And um, as I became involved with the near-death experience community, uh, that message was solidified to me because that was a message that many NDEers bring back with them. That right. we are all one, and that really jived with what I was told by Jesus Himself. Now, I do want to get on because um, your next uh, uh, encounter or hound, if you will, uh, <laughs> was uh, involved reincarnation, which is very interesting to me. Um, you had a, a you'd I guess gone and bought books about angels and about reincarnation, and then you said one night you prayed to God and asked if reincarnation is real, and if that's so, who was I? That's absolutely correct. And uh, when Jesus visited me in that second experience, I had not asked for that. As mm-hmm. I said, I, I you know, poo-pooed the angel thing and decided that wasn't really angels, And um, but Jesus had pursued me. I didn't, you know, further. I opened the door with yelling at God, but then, you know, I let it go. This third event uh, or experience, yes, I was a little more, by this time, uh, I was, and I knew that visitation was unlike any dream I'd had, so I knew something was going on, and I was becoming a little more, uh, you know, convinced, you might say. So this third time uh, experience, I, I did, you were... You said it exactly rightly. I had come across the idea of reincarnation in one of these books I was reading and went to bed that night and I prayed uh, to God. And I, I, you know, I I said a simple prayer about, you know, keep my family healthy and da, 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 and all these kind of really childish kind of basic things. And then very cursory, I threw out there. And you know what, God, by the way, if this reincarnation stuff is real, uh, you know, I'd like to know if it's real. And if it is, who was I? That was really flippant. You know, it wasn't like I was begging God, I need to know who I am and I need to know if reincarnation was real. It was so really off the cuff. But uh, again, I was sleeping and I was in a deep sleep. And again, I was woken up. My consciousness was awakened and my attention was, you know, uh, directed to the left of me. And unlike, again, any other dream I've ever had, this was so strange. uh, I began to see letters coming at me. And at first there was an A and it came forward and it sort of faded. And then a B came at me and it sort of faded and then an S and as these letters came forward, I was sounding it out. So I was like, absa. And then uh, I was sounding it out letter by letter. And when the word ended, it started to come at me again, but a little quicker this time. And I was sounding it out sort of syllable by syllable the second time, absa. And then the third time, and I'm not t- telling you yet the name because I'm waiting till this third time, but the very last time, the name came at me quicker again, and I said it very fluently, Absalom. And I realized that it was a name, 
But something happened on that third occurrence that I did not see the first two times. And that was that the letters were coming off the top uh, right hand page of what was clearly a Bible. You know, Bible has a very distinct look, the small lettering, the thin pages and whatnot. I, it was clearly a Bible. And when I noticed that, snap, the vision ended, just like before. It was like, okay, you got it, it's done. You know, it's just, just enough for you to, to get that information. And with that, Lee, my eyes flew open and I, I sat straight up in bed and I realized without a shadow of a doubt that God had just answered my direct question to him. Mm. So um, by that time it was morning, there was already light coming in the window. Um, so I dove to my bottom night hand, nightstand drawer where I had a Bible that my stepmother had bought me years and years earlier. Um, she's Christian and she, you know, gave that to me as a gift and I was never going to read it. So that's where I stuck it. <laughs> <laughs> and when I pulled it out, there was still uh, some wrapping paper taped to the back, you know, and I peeled that off and I, I hopped back on the bed and Lee, <laughs> you know, I, you think that's amazing. Well, I opened that Bible. I did not have to shuffle through the Bible and, you know, I, I knew nothing about the Bible, where to look, where anything. I opened that Bible to the exact page where Absalom was listed on the top right-hand corner where, where his name was. Hmm. And I was like, I mean, I just, I kind of looked around the room, you know, thinking <laughs> that was not me that opened this. This is too, too surreal. And I felt so heady at that moment, like something is going on. <laughs> and, uh, then I started to read the story and I realized that I'd been dropped a little bit uh, into the story on, on that page. And I believe it was one, page 144. Um, but anyway, I backed up to the beginning of the story. It's uh, in Second Samuel, is it? The story of David's son, Absalom? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. And uh, as I began to read, I didn't even know really who this David was. And uh, in the years since, I, you know, pretty quickly as I investigated it afterward, I realized he was the David of David and Goliath, Goliath fame. And yes. uh, that would have been my associate, you know, that would have been my recognition. But mm -hmm. then I went a little further and I realized, well, shoot, this guy's even more important than just this David and Goliath story. <laughs> yes, he was King David. Yeah, well, that's how little I, I really knew, I'm ashamed to say. But... Beloved of God. Well, Nancy, this has been a wonderful discussion, and I'm so glad that we're going to continue it next week. But for today, I'm afraid we are just out of time. Thank you so much for telling us your remarkable story right up to Absalom, and we're going to continue there next week. You're um, welcome, Lee. <laughs> and I look very forward to it. All right. Well, tell the listeners how they can find your website and your book. Well, my website is uh, nancyvanalphen.com, and that's uh, V-A-N-A-L-P-H-E-N.com. The book is available on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble, and um, I'm working on an audio version now, which I'm hoping will be out uh, in the next few months or so. Terrific. And listeners, for more about IANDS, a wonderful organization, go to iands.org. And tune in again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern, for more of Nancy's story and more NDE Radio. This is Lee Whitting saying thanks for listening.